listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, a podcast about gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Anthony. This is Chris. This is Daniel. This is Drew. Welcome to the episode, everybody. Episode 43. Very special versus episode this week. Also, if you happen to be in Saddlebrook, it is Extra Life today. Today, right now. Hurry on down. <laughs> this very moment. We, we're waiting for you, man. Where are you? When I was talking about saving you as tea at the table, this is what I was talking about. Come on, we're waiting to play. Where are you? Come on, man. Seriously. Okay, we really want you to, to listen to the podcast, but not right this second. We've been waiting for you to take your turn for like 15 minutes. <laughs> play Come in the on. car. Play in the car on the way over. <laughs> Uh, like as we said before, uh, Extra Life, very excited this year. Um, we'll have an update for you guys in the next episode about how it went. But this week, it is on. If you were there, it went awesome. So yeah. <laughs> and if you weren't, then uh, whatever. And if you guys don't show up, we're just going to take all the games for ourselves. So. <laughs> <laughs> and what's that address again? That would be Gamers Gambit, 446 Market Street, Saddlebrook, New Jersey. And we're going to be there until... It's from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. All right. And if you can't be there, you can still donate. Check out BoardGamersAnonymous.com for information on how to donate. All right. So that is Extra Life this week. Uh, in other news and PR, let Drew take it away. Go, Drew, Go! It's actually something really cool. Um, there's, there's all sorts of uh, controversy in the gaming world now, this gamer gate and how women are being perceived in, uh, in gaming. Um, at least publishers now being aware of what they can do about this uh, and stepping up. Uh, Wonderforge had, um, had the licensing for this game, Justice League, Axis of Villains, that they sold through Target. Um, the trouble is they didn't have any female superheroes in the game. Wow. None whatsoever. <laughs> there are. They're out there. Really? But the Justice League game. Yeah. No playable. I couldn't playable. think of a single woman. <laughs> I, I wonder why they couldn't think of a single <laughs> woman who's in the Justice League. Okay, you're being... Uh... It's a little awkward. <laughs> a little awkward. awkward. <laughs> that one was forced. All right, fair enough. That one was forced. <laughs> But uh, no playable ones. So what? Th- this one dad of a of a superhero loving daughter um, took the game and just rewrote some of the characters. Okay, basically good. for females, um, and he just did that on his own. It's like cool. Okay, we all do that sometimes too with our games. But uh, a, a website caught wind of that and made a big article about that. So that Wonder Forge now stepped forward and apologized for not doing that. Um, Wow. And, wow. Yeah. yeah, good for them because that was wrong. Yeah, so yeah. they're redesigning that. Uh, it's a nice thing to see. A, I mean, it was, it was a straightforward apology, like, "Oh crap, that yeah, that was our mistake." Yep. That's yeah. that's nice to that see was. from a large, a pretty large corporation. Well, they right? actually used the phrase "we screwed up." Wow, <laughs> that is. <laughs> That's rare. I'm not used to hearing that sort of actual apology from public figures or corporations. It wasn't one of those kind of like half apologies where I'm sorry that you took what we did in a certain way that wasn't what we meant. Wow. <laughs> That's... Here's, you know, here's another company that's uh, that's being good to uh, its uh, players. Uh, I told you a, a while ago about the um, cease and desist order that was put out by Fantasy Flight against their top, their number one fan-based website. Yes. Well, AEG is actually going out of its way to promote fan websites. Uh, They have this, uh, they've been promoting Doomtown DB um, in support of one of its games. They love having fans create websites. So they were setting the example, and uh, this has been getting a lot of publicity to the point where the Getting to the point where the webmaster of Netrunner DB that was received the cease and desist just decided he's going to reopen his site. So Netrunner is back up again, the DB, the fan site. Um, because and this is where you got to read Australian Tabletop Gaming Network. I'm not going to repeat everything they wrote. They have a beautiful, well-researched article explaining what Fantasy Flight's uh, point may have been and how this Netrunner DB just got caught up in it. So Mm -hmm. the webmaster decided, well, I'm going to go back on and we'll see what happens. And so far, at this point, he hasn't been harassed anymore, hasn't received any more letters. 
Um, but Fantasy Flight's obviously trying to... Um, they also went against this other website that was actually creating an online uh, game platform. I mean, this is something that happens throughout the entire realm of geekdom where people love, love the intellectual property. And honestly, I got to say, 99% of the time, there isn't a fan that's trying to encroach or try to make money off of it. They're spending hours and effort and, you know, special abilities to kind of craft these fan-based projects, websites, and media. And it's terrible that these companies just can't let them, you know, play with their toys. (laughs) Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just it's just sad because, you know, if someone's making money off your product, yeah, absolutely. You should go after them because that's not fair. It's your product. And uh, any really good fan wants the product to be protected. But if they're trying to add to it, if they're trying to serve a fan base that you can't get to for whatever reason, you should applaud them, not sue them. Well, the Australian uh, Tabletop Gaming Network suggested that this could be related to FFG's purchase of a fan site that this could be the first step in, okay, we have our fan site, and this is going to be the official fan site, and trying to knock down. So, Boom. yeah, it could be. Boom. We'll have to see. Events will have to uh, pan out. But at least Boom. props to AEG <laughs> for supporting their fan. Good fan for you, base. AEG. Yeah. We love you, man. Hi, something I just found out about, never knew about this before, Umba. Have you guys ever heard of that? Umba.tv. It's, oh. an, it's an online streaming service. Seems like you're making that up. No. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's spelled U-U-M-B-A. Is it spelled <laughs> No, no I umlauts. don't know where the U button is <laughs> on the keyboard. Umlauts, but no, it's just regular O-O-M-B-A <laughs> okay. .tv. Um, they are gamer friendly. Okay. So they've been, they've been streaming, live streaming uh, Gen Con. They, I think they live stream uh, tabletop because... Um, I know there's a YouTube for that, but they also they, they live stream it too, so you can watch tabletop they, as it's. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's all about live streaming, but they also do um, tournaments. They run they have this tournament app on their website, so they not only film game tournaments, but you know you can run it through the website. And they just ran at Gen Con a world record rock paper scissors tournament. <laughs> <laughs> The largest number, 2,950 participants. Wow. So they got it registered with uh, Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, it wasn't officially Rock, Paper, Scissors. It was the expansion Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock. Of course. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, I love when they add the expansion. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's a blast. Only apply. That's only apply. But uh, it, I learned two things. That Uma live streams from time to time, game uh, events, and that they have a tournament feature. So if you want to run your own tournament. And their name is awesome. Umba. Yeah. It's like somebody will create a game now, a, a family friendly game. Umba. <laughs> oh, I want to go back to AEG. I should have mentioned this earlier. AEG is getting a, a head start on the Thanksgiving Black Friday season. Ooh. They are coming out with a Black Friday mystery box. Ooh. You go to their website, you can pre order $50. Uh oh. You get four <laughs> games. You get four games. You don't know this. what they are. Yeah. You don't know. They've probably been sitting around in their, in their <laughs> warehouse, but you're, you're going to get your money's worth. It's more than 50 bucks. I think this would be a great idea for other game companies to clear out their, their stock. You know, 50 bucks, four games. How, you know. you get four different versions of Love Letter. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. I hope not. It kind of makes you think about the Steam, the Steam bundles where you yeah. can buy, buy every game that this company has ever made. And, yeah, this is awesome. It's $30. <laughs> and you buy it all. And, like, I want to play one of these. And it's uh, not worth thirty dollars. It's not worth thirty dollars. <laughs> you know what this is? This is the 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 kind of the trend that you pay money for these boxes, so you yeah. get the geek box or something, and it's just a random box of things that just kind of come to your house. Mystery box, yeah. And these yeah. Mystery boxes, and it's like, wow, that really great stuff. If you happen to get that box worth of stuff, and not just random things that you don't want, yeah. you know. And then it ends up being in a what are those? Uh, Swap meets where you just give away something you don't want. See, I, yeah. I love this idea, but I own so many AEG products that I'm just going to get duplicates. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I'm actually pretty low on AEG, so maybe I'll pick one up. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's well, know what comes in the box. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chris, if you get duplicates, you can always donate them to the Extra Life for next year, Extra Life 2015. That's a great idea, Drew. I think I'll do that. It's not too early to start working toward that. Because I love AEG, and yeah, sure. A box of random <laughs> AEG stuff is great. 
Did you know that there's, and, and Drew might be interested because Drew does not like us talking about video games, but Drew, there's <laughs> actually a physical board game version of Hearthstone. Now, of course it's an illegal copy made by well. China, <laughs> but there's actually a card version, and you can take a look online, you can find this, where they actually printed up all the cards, they made a mat for the game, and counters and chits, so you can actually play Hearthstone in a physical version. Now, it does mean that a 15-minute game will now take, I don't know, two hours to play, <laughs> But Hearthstone is actually now physical. If you're in the market for Chinese knockoffs, you can pick this up. Okay. Hey, got a couple business-related items that you might want to know. Um, somebody did a survey of uh, fan conventions, uh, 2,600 attendees of fan conventions. I think a lot of this was comic conventions, but also game conventions, any, any kind of fan conventions. Um, one of the interesting things is the gender split. Uh, because we always think of fan cons uh, of any sort as being male dominated, but it's actually 45% of the attendees are female of all these uh, respondents in the survey. Under 30 years of age, it's a straight 50 50 split. So there are a lot of women. This is, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about how this is a male dominated uh, hobby, but women are there, need to speak up. And one thing they noticed that women spend just as much as men. At conventions too, so vendors may may see geeks, male geeks, and and start drooling. But women, women do it. The thing that um, the one surprising thing is that from the survey is that at higher incomes, women with higher incomes will spend the money at conventions. Men with the higher incomes spend it at uh, online. Wow. Okay. From the survey, that didn't know that. So women have a lot of money to spend. Let's treat them better. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, That's a great message. <laughs> the power of the pocketbook, man. Yeah, I mean, it, it's something gaming and sort of, you know, quote unquote geek hobbies in general. The people who produce the goods seem to be totally unaware of the fact that the population of people purchasing is pretty equally distributed across gender, right? There's, there's this perception, right, like you say, from top down that all of these things are male dominated, right? That comics are male dominated, that video games uh, are male dominated. When re in reality, right, it's. It's not a boy's game, right? No. It's, it's everybody's game, right? Everybody likes to play a game. It's just that boys tend to be noisier and more attention-grabbing, so you notice them more. But the other, the other thing was a um, report on gaming popularity among uh, RPGs. Initiative Tabletop came up with this. Um, and just one, a couple quick facts from it. The, the number one game uh, that people have on the top of their list is Pathfinder. The number two is D and D three point five, which actually outpolls D and D five by quite a bit. Now five is new, fifth edition, obviously, but it's incredible how f far more popular three point five is than even four. Um, Forty five percent of all polled have played three point five recently. Well, four was a fail. Yeah, uh, complete. Big, I mean, it's played pretty broadly, but even the people who play four kind of recognize that. It's not the D&D &D that you kind of grew up with or that you expect to play. It's kind of like, I want to roll dice and hit things. Yeah. yeah. So 12% of all the ones uh, have, have put 5th edition at the top of their list. So it's it's in there now. It's on the list. It's only going to rise. There are, a, you know, they list all these interesting RPGs, but I'm not going to bore you with it. I just thought, um, I just thought I'd share those little tidbits. One final tidbit, which is actually... <laughs> Heavy piece of scientific psychology news from this, this so deep and boring that you don't want to hear about it magazine called Brain and Language, October 2014. Harvard Business Review reported on this, and that's how I found it. Bilingualism trains specific brain circuits involved in flexible rule selection and application. Hmm. I'm just going to give you the didn't read too long version. People who learned two or more languages may have an advantage to the game table. That's what I'm taking away from this. Okay. Because they pick up on uh, variations in rules faster, on changing rules. Here's a phrase that I just want to leave you with. Learning more than one language improves your executive function. Executive function is a set of mental processes that help you connect past experience with present action. Planning, organizing, strategizing, paying attention to and remembering details, managing time and space, all the things you need 
to play board games well. So, and, and our good friend, John McCallion, um, who is a longtime reviewer of Games Magazine and who, God, he, he's edited other game magazines. Ab, he loves abstracts, written many articles about abstract games. The guy knows six languages. Ooh. So, I'm, you know, that's just one anecdote, but I'm wondering if anybody, any listeners know of any proof that could back that up. Do people who know more than one language seem to have an advantage? Seem to be able to pick things up quicker, be able to, to think more nimbly. Well, we know that language, you know, at least when we talk about the, the, the circuitry of the brain, language is mathematics. You know, being able to um, break down symbols, to make connections, to um, put together complex patterns and calculations is very much what most of your most Euro games are all about. To kind of, you know, being able to kind of manage and handle all of that in a very fluid way and on the fly. So to be able to kind of think in two languages is like kind of dealing with math on a, a really quantum kind of level. Like you're, you're managing multiple calculations at the same time. So yeah, that would make sense. Now, there are a lot of well, pretty well-known general cognitive benefits to being bilingual. Though there is the sort of causation correlation question on some of these, right? Because if you are, if you have a low IQ, right? Or if you have difficult learning difficulties, it will be harder for you to become bilingual. Right, at least later in life, right, right. than right. it would be for someone who has otherwise already got these strengths. But there are pretty well known benefits here, I think. We'd have to study, okay? Players who have learned like two languages as a child, okay, so we mm -hmm. eliminate that and then put them down at a game table and let them face off and see who wins. <laughs> well, <laughs> I want to study they, this. If I they do. speak German, they probably know most of the rule sets that... <laughs> well, if they go to Essen and pick up all these games that aren't released in America, they've got the advantage. They know the rules. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Most, and, of the, most of these uh, games that translate to English anyway would never really do a good job with the rule set anyway. So if you can read the original German or French or Japanese, that would probably give you a step up. And that's some good PR from the tabletop. Alrighty, so that's everything for the news segment this week. Next up, our acquisition disorders. Acquisition Disorder Corner. Alrighty, so Acquisition Disorders. Uh, Essen was last week. We talked about that a little bit, and it's this time of year. There's just tons of stuff coming out. Anybody got anything good that they're looking at? Uh, well, I found two werewolf variants that I thought were pretty interesting, or maybe not werewolf variants so that might not be appropriate, but werewolf-style games. Um, so we've got Secret Moon, which is a werewolf-style game set in the love letter universe and you, what you'd end up doing is having two teams the princess team and the minister team i'm not too sure exactly how it plays out because i've only just found this one but it seems like it could be really interesting and you know i like the love letter universe werewolf's a fun time putting those two things together could come out well but the one that really caught my attention is a game called vampire mafia the reason I said it might not be appropriate to talk about these as being werewolf variants is apparently Vampire Mafia came first. Of course it, it did. did. <laughs> uh, it was published in the USSR in 1986, uh, at least according to their quick little blurb on Board Game Geek. Uh, the thing that makes this one most interesting to me is, you know, vampires, whatever, werewolves, vampires, same thing. Um, but the idea that this game comes with plastic masks in it. Like, you wear masks <laughs> while you're playing the game. Of course you do. <laughs> of course you do. I've never played a game that shipped me masks as a game component, wow. and I kind of want to see what that turns out like. Yeah. Oh, you didn't unique. play the Eyes Wide Shut board game? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, th I think it'd be kind of interesting. It's And it's supposed to be a pretty unique setting, right? So the vampires are the good guys, and you're trying to find the vampire hunters and get rid of them. So kind of an inversion of the werewolf mechanic there. But... Uh, yeah, the most interesting thing to me is they're going to ship masks with it. That's I I don't That's know of any other board game that does that. <laughs> I don't know what to make of don't it. Don't keep and trying to think of one. Just <laughs> yeah, accept I, it. I, 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 it might <laughs> with it. It's such a brutal curiosity at this point in time that I might be willing to give them money just because I'm curious. Are they going to have like mask expansions in the future? Where you get more masks. More? <laughs> that would be great, right? Like you and like you can get custom masks. Like this, you know, like make it wood. Or DIY like, masks too. Yeah. We can create our own. Make new characters. All I could think of with that is 
what disease am I going to get from the person who wore this mask before me? Yeah, you have to clean them a lot. Yeah. But you could make an, adap- an adaptation of this, right? You could do like a masquerade party oh. based around this game, I bet. That would be a lot of fun. And maybe you could even blend it a little bit with Vampire the Masquerade, but I don't know, that might be going too literal there. But I think that'd be really interesting. We'll see how it plays out. Yeah, I mean, it sounds interesting, if nothing else. Yeah. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Pretty much exactly what you said. It's yeah. interesting. Let's see how it plays out, but in a slightly different tone of voice. From <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, I want to jump in real quick with uh, uh, something that I, I saw a blurb about the other day. I won it. Um, Panamax from yeah. Stronghold Games. It's a Panama Canal game. Uh, it's got some really unique features where you're you're pushing along the other ships trying to get through the canal. It's a part pickup delivery. It's it's one of those um, use your dice to do different things with, like we talked about with Dead of Winter last week, and like Quantum Alien Frontiers. There's all these games with um, now coming out with using dice for actions, um, and this is one of those too. Um, it's got just a lot of different interesting mechanics and a, and a pretty cool theme I've never seen before. So uh, I want to play this. Yeah, it sounds interesting. Um, I know for me, also on the Stronghold bandwagon, uh, we've got two expansions coming out for Among the Stars. Uh, I think one's the Ambassadors and the other one is called Expanding the Alliance. Um, I haven't really read a lot about what they include yet. Uh, I know that there's some more races in there and a couple new mechanics but honestly you just tell me you're expanding among the stars and i'm in i'm good i'll I'll pick that up uh one of the benefits i guess of a game taking a couple years to hit america is we get all the expansions that came out in the last two Ah, years cool (laughs) so those have been on pre-order with uh stronghold for a couple months now they should be coming out any time all right so that's all the acquisition disorders for this week uh next up let's take a look at some of the games we've been playing lately the table this week all right so at the table this week uh, guys what'd you get to the table well i had the opportunity to play mission red planet and i was really looking forward to this game because i heard a lot of good things about it it's been out of print for some time and hopefully this thing is going to come back into print pretty soon because it's a really unique game because it involves a number of different mechanics so First off, the object of the game is just like any good Euro game to score victory points. How do you do that? Well, you want to get area control over Mars. Now, it has a little bit of a kind of alien frontiers as you're landing astronauts on different parts of Mars to control it. Now, what it has in addition to that and what the main mechanic is, is you'll get a number of roll cards. So it's It's one through nine on the roll cards, and each of these different roll cards has a different kind of steampunk astronaut that has um, two different abilities. One is how many astronauts will they add to either the spaceships or will they affect on the planet? And the second is their special ability, whether they're a saboteur, they can blow up a spaceship, uh, they can move a spaceship into launch before it's filled up, and a a whole number of other abilities. So each player gets a deck of these cards. They get to play, you know, choose one of these, play it secretly. Everyone flips over. It cut, It goes in number order. So the lower numbers happen first, and the larger numbers tend to be a little bit more powerful. And then, you know, during the game, you can play the one card again to kind of take everyone back into your hand. But once a card is played, it's played. So the astronauts that you'll be playing will be placed on spaceships that will have a certain number that's required to take off. And then it has a certain destination on Mars in which it will land. So it has this really cute little spaceships that are set up on the landing platforms. And it tells you the number that's required. And then you'll get a chance to place your astronauts on wherever you want to place them. They'll land on the planet. And then based upon the special cards, the event cards that are placed in those areas, it will determine if that area scores or if there's some special wacky condition or no condition at all. And it was a very fun game. It had a lot of different mechanics to it. The one thing that was a little bit challenging for me was there was so much to the game as far as what roles do you play, when do the ships take off, will they even take off, if they land, where do you move the pieces around, and then you have special victory point cards that say, well... You know, if you control this section, you'll gain extra victory points. So it's like, all right, so I got to manage that as well. 
And then there was, if you get these special ice victory points, which are these one-point victory points, you can get a bonus at the end of the game. So there was, like, almost too much to have to manage and too much in your head as far as what will actually win you the game that you almost had to kind of, like, throw out strategy out the window and just kind of go, I'm just going to play these things and see how they work out because you almost couldn't manage how everything plays together. So for me, this game is a solid play. I would like to say buy it, but it's almost too random to be a buy for me. But I really did enjoy playing Mission Red Planet. All right, cool. I mean, it looks pretty fun. Um, I like the map, like just of the planet. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, it's a little abstract looking. Everything's a token, obviously. Sure. But um, anytime, like you see a lot of sci-fi games, you don't always see ones kind of set in our own solar system. That's fun. It's true. Yeah. And it had that uh, Citadel's mechanic where you had the different roles and you could play them. So maybe Daniel put a lot of people on a ship, but I played Saboteur, and now I'm going to blow up the ship. Or I can play Pilot, and I can send the ship to a different location. Oh, nice. So it has a lot of that kind of stuff, but it's it, it gets a little random. I like how you went right for the two strategies that could classify <laughs> you as like an interstellar terrorist. Like, <laughs> I'm going to blow up a ship full of people, or I'm going to hijack it. Like Those are my strategies here. Well, that's the most player interactive type of mechanic. We're walking you. We just walking learned something you. about you, Chris. Just <laughs> learned something. A game I played uh, recently. Uh, it's actually another one I, I re- first played with John from his collection. Um, Carcassonne, South Seas. Um, what I really liked about this game is how much more I enjoyed it than I enjoy the other Carcassonne games. Wow. <laughs> just not a big fan. I mean, I don't, I don't detest them like I do superhero games and Tolkien games, but... Um, <laughs> That's okay. It's only like <laughs> half the games out there. <laughs> yeah, right? But um, it, it's still got the familiar tile-laying um, mechanic. You're, you're laying down islands and parts of islands and also paths between islands, and you're also trying to gather resources from, from the ocean, fish and uh, bananas and shellfish and fish. And in addition to all of this, you have... Um, I'm trying to think of what game also has this. Orders. Oh, Coal Baron was one of those. Um, Very frequently, you get these worker placement games where you have orders to fill. You collect produce, and then you ship them to fulfill these orders. Well, this Carcassonne South Seas has orders that you have to fulfill for points. So you're you're trying to, to control areas. You're trying to lay your meeples down. You're trying to collect produce and fulfill these orders for points to win the game. Um, it just has a nice blend of features that I like in a game, and not as boring. It, it sort of there, there was more of a tension. You really had to watch what everyone else was playing, make sure they didn't cut you off, make sure they didn't uh, complete a circle of paths around islands. Um, it's tough knowing you know, where to place your tile and when. I like the tension in it. Kept me going uh, all the way through Carcassonne South Seas. All right, so that's all that's been at table this week. Uh, next up, we're going to look at. A company that, ironically, is very well versed in Tolkien and superheroes. And it's uh, Cryptozoic, but these two games are neither of the above. I, uh, I, I would say it's Drew's Kryptonite, but he wouldn't accept that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually read a blog about that. Somebody uh, talked about Kryptonite games that that we just don't do well at. That that's what his reference of it is a game that you you may be great at everything, but that one game you just cannot win. That's your Kryptonite. I get a few of those. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that, you just for some reason, you can't get your head around. You can't. Uh... Yeah, it's just not quite there. And now for the feature review. All right, this week on Versus, we're talking about two brand new Cryptozoic games. Now, we've talked about Cryptozoic in the past, in particular, the DC deck building game that we've really enjoyed, the original and the expansion. Now, Cryptozoic is kind of known for using their Cerebus engine. This is their deck building engine that kind of brings a kind of easy and fun deck building game to your table. Now, let's start off with what we're looking at here. Now, in this versus, we're looking at Naruto versus Street Fighter. So two fighting games kind of face-to-face Which is the best fighting game? Which one reigns supreme? Let's find out. So first off, for those of you who have not played these deck builders before, let me talk very briefly about how these games play. Now, 
if you've never played a deck builder before, what you're basically looking at is getting a hand of cards and then throughout the game, you'll be able to purchase new cards to add to your deck in order to bring together some amazing combinations. If you've played deck builders before, it's not a traditional dominion. It's more along the lines of an ascension because while you're picking up and buying cards from a middle row, you're building up a more and more powerful hand. Now, what makes this game a lot simpler than Ascension and Dominion is there's only one currency, power. So you won't have to worry about attack versus money like with Legendary. You're just looking at pulling together a big number so that you can knock out the villains and purchase new cards. So when you start the game, you're gonna get 10 cards, seven punches, and three vulnerabilities. Now, punch cards will give you plus one power, but they're not worth anything at the end of the game. Three vulnerabilities that will go into your initial hand will just kind of muck it up a little bit. So when you get, when you draw your initial five card hand, those three vulnerabilities are just gonna be lousy. You're gonna be like, oh man, I, I don't have a good hand to buy anything with. But not to worry, there's cards in the game that will actually let you destroy those cards and you won't have to worry about your hand anymore. Now, what I really like about both of these games and the Cerebus engine overall is it's a nice, light, entry-level gateway game that pretty much anyone can play. So let's talk about the card itself. So when you're looking at the cards, and I'm talking about the cards that you'll play in your hand and in the game, there's a couple of different things to look at. The victory point um, total will be in the bottom left hand corner. So most games you'll see a star. Here you'll see a little shuriken for the Naruto game, which will actually show the victory point. So at the end of the game, you'll look at all your cards, you'll count up all the victory points, and that determines who is the winner, with the exception of a certain cards in each of these games that will actually allow a different win condition. Now on the right side of the card, is the cost of the card. So when the game starts, five cards will go into a lineup in front of you, and they'll obviously they'll be all different costs. So you will count up how many different punches you can put together to purchase a card. Now, in addition to the, the row of five, there'll also be kicks in this game. And every game of their AEG Cerebus engine, there's always kicks that you can purchase. They're pretty cheap and they they give you the opportunity to have plus two power instead of the plus one that a punch has. So a kick is stronger than a punch. See, thematic, right? Now, in these games, you're gonna have very similar types of cards, whether it's a DC, whether it's a Naruto, whether it's a Lord of the Rings, or whether it's a Street Fighter. So you're gonna look at ally cards. So you'll be able to purchase any cards from this row. So there'll be ally cards, there'll be enemy cards, there'll be technique cards, there'll be location cards, and that will make up your deck. Now, for both games, there's going to be a special deck of cards. For the Naruto deck, there's going to be arch enemy cards. This is very similar to the DC deck builder game where you're going to have these big baddie guys that you really have to attack. That will determine the end of the game. If you knock out all those bad guys, the game ends and you can count up points. In addition to that, there's also an opportunity to end the game if the deck that's filling up the middle row runs out, but that rarely happens, but hold on, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, with the Naruto deck, you're gonna fight arch enemies. In the Street Fighter deck, you're gonna have stages. So you remember playing Street Fighter where each stage was from a different country in the world, so you fly to USA and that would be Ken's stage or Guile's stage. Well, you're actually gonna have a card that's gonna show that background, which is really nice. On the bottom, whether it's an arch enemy or a stage, it's gonna be a certain cause that, that you must kind of reach in order to knock out that villain or accomplish that stage. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Also during out the game, those special stages slash arch enemy is gonna have a special ability. So when you defeat that arch enemy or that stage, that will go to your discard pile, which will eventually get shuffled back into your deck and eventually get into your hand and you can play that for special abilities. Now, in this game, you'll have attacks and you'll have defenses. So at some point during the game, someone is going to launch an attack either at you directly or there'll be group attacks like with arch enemies. Now, those attack affects everybody. If it's a group attack, if it's a personal attack, you get to pick who that attack goes against. But not to worry, you can play a defense card to actually stop that attack. 
Now, that's the general about everything when it comes to the Cerebus engine and all the games combined. Now, let's talk about specifics. Now, when it comes to Naruto, there's some differences in this game in comparison to Street Fighter. Now, whether it's Street Fighter, DC, Lord of the Rings, you're going to have a large character card that's going to be you during the game. Now, with the Naruto cards, there's going to be four different sides on this card that are going to represent the different areas that will charge up your chakra. So, you might have a side that says enemy, technique, ally, and enemy. So, when you're building your hand, you want to keep and pay attention to those special areas because that will build chakra that will allow you to do the special ability on your card. So, for example, Hanada in the, in the game... If she builds up three chakra, she will be able to activate her special ability, which allows her to draw two cards, which is a great ability. Now, this has also been true in the DC deck builder, for example, where Batman benefits from having equipment played. Now, as I mentioned, with Naruto, you're going to deal with chakra, which is very thematic. If you know anything about Naruto Shippenden, this is a big part of the game. So... Building Chakra allows you to use special abilities, not just on your main card, but with additional cards throughout the game. Now, sometimes it's hard to kind of match up all those spots, but not to worry, because in the Naruto game, there's also hand signs. Now, hand signs are, are a one-shot ability. You'll be able to purchase them for one cost and then play them in the game for Chakra. So that's kind of a quick way to kind of build up your, to build up your special ability. The hand sign cards allow you to get two chakra for one cost, and once it's spent, it's a one shark card that goes back into the pile instead of back into your hand. Now, let's talk about the difference with Street Fighter. So, what's great about Street Fighter, it has all the original Street Fighter characters, although Blanca is a promo card and why I don't know. But in addition to that, it has Fei Long, Kami, and Akuma, which is great. Now, Street Fighter is different because their special ability is an ultra card that you will be able to purchase throughout the game. So instead of just having purchasing cards from the middle, you'll be able to have an ultra card that's underneath your card. And now this is the special difference here with this game because you'll be able to purchase cards from the main deck and some of those cards will have a special ability which will say that you can place cards under your hero which you can purchase later. So you'll actually have your own special deck to purchase from, but if you don't purchase it, it doesn't count towards your final victory point goal. Now the ultras give you plus two on an attack and it also acts as an attack and defense card. So when you get this card in your hand, it's very versatile to use in a number of different ways, whether it's defending yourself or scoring some extra bonus points that you need in the game. Now Street Fighter is a little different because what you're going to be doing mainly in this game is attacking other players, whereas Naruto fits more of the thematic type of game where you're just trying to draw cards into your hand to come up with a more powerful combination. Now, there was some criticism over the DC deck building game because they couldn't understand why would you want to have, you know, if you're Batman, why you're having Superman's x-ray vision and Jokers in your deck helping you out. But if you've ever you know, either read the manga or watch the anime, you know that the thing about Naruto is, is that eventually bad guys temporarily become good guys and help you out. So collecting villains, collecting special abilities, co collecting special techniques is part of that universe and very thematic. For the Street Fighter one, you still have that little bit of oddness that you're bringing all these different characters and techniques into your hand. But since you'll be attacking other players, directly it's more thematic in that way and that's really nice to see now what the funny thing is with both games is you're going to have weakness cards that are going to kind of muddle up your deck in the street fighter version you're going to have dan do you remember dan from street fighter oh god <laughs> he actually is the weakness card in that's your game that's perfect that's amazing yeah, I <laughs> so like i that. really like the thematic nature of this um what the good thing is is that you'll be able to actually play weaknesses in the Street Fighter game in order to discard them. Mm, nice. hmm. So they'll go back to the pile, which is nice. So you don't have to worry too much about them, but it's it's still going to slow you down a bit too. Now, with both games, you have to pay attention to the weakness cards because they're minus 1 at the end of the game. So if you don't if you don't get rid of your weakness cards, they're really going to cost you not just in the play, but in the final score. 
So we talked about how the super villains in the Street Fighter game are actually the stages slash locations for the game. But in addition to that, there's no initial attack. So when you play when you play the DC deck builder or you play Naruto, when those cards finally come out, they're gonna hit everybody. That's not true about the Street Fighter game. It's not gonna hurt everybody. But when you do defeat a stage, what you're gonna do is randomly draw one of the large hero cards and that attack is going to occur just upon you. So you could defend against it or something. So you might go to the USA stage, flip over a card, and maybe it turns out to be Ken. Ken's going to hit you with his special ability that's on his big card, but you have to defend against it or just take a hit. But you're still getting the card whether you defeat him or not. So in this game, you're going to get a lot of weakness cards in your hand because there's a lot of attacks kind of getting thrown back and forth, and the game does slow down despite the fact that you can discard weakness cards. So Street Fighter is going to be a bit of a longer game, but it's going to give you a personal pile to buy, buy from. And it, it's thematic in the way that you can actually attack each other. And the while the ultras are thematic, it kind of plays back and forth more along the lines of a two-player game. If you're really looking for a two-player deck builder game, this is probably the one you're looking for. So that is Naruto Shippenden and Street Fighter the deck building game versus the versus. Let's go back and see what everyone thought. Drew, you got a chance to play oh, that, Naruto, right? Yes, I did actually. Um, I like the uh, the fact that you're. I like the fact that really victory depends on two different things. Now, it's not just a matter of totaling up a certain number of power points to get more cards and defeat enemies, but now you have to balance it out with chakra, um, and sometimes those two numbers are competing. You know, you can go for different cards, different abilities with depending on which one you want to focus sure. on. So you want to have enough chakra to give you special powers, but you also want to be building up your power to, to conquer the enemies. Yes. Um, cool balance in that. It, it gives it a little extra twist for this deck builder. But I think I'd still enjoy this like with most of these kinds of deck builders in a in a two on two version i know that it's adaptable for that service engine allows for that i've been reading i want to try that out because i think that'd be more fun that'd be cool yeah as far as the theme is concerned now i've talked about these games before they're almost like a the potato chip of the board game universe that you know there's a flavor for everybody and for the naruto game it does feel thematic for me you know naruto's special card he benefits by punches which is because he's just really a basic kind of shinobi. He really doesn't have a lot of kind of um, martial arts ability. So his basic cards really benefit him. In addition to that, there's two slots for enemies. So he benefits off having enemies on his side. And if you know the series, that happens a lot. He brings enemies along as allies. Now, there are other cards like um, Kakashi, who is known as the copy shinobi. So his special ability is if his, if you can trigger it with the chakra, he can copy or use the ability of one of the special abilities in the row in front of you. So that's very thematic too. And I think finally, as I said earlier, the DC version, everyone was complaining that you have villains in the heroes deck. Being able to have villains that you know from the history, and this game is super, super soaking with theme because it has every character from their history, every villain, Every technique, every special jitsu is in here. So when you play this, you really do feel like you're playing the game or you're playing a special episode. Um, the Street Fighter one is a little different because it's a lot of attacking back and forth. And surprisingly, it takes a lot longer, which I'm not sure if I like because this is a very light deck building game. And a light deck building game shouldn't take a very long time. Yeah, the Cerberus engine is great, but it's great because it lets you streamline things and move, play a deck builder very swiftly and very smoothly. And if things start slowing down, I feel like the, the merit to the Cerberus engine start to fall by the wayside. It's, it's an efficient system. It's a quick system. But yeah, as soon as things start slowing down, it starts to lose its fun, I think. Yeah, and it's just mm. when, you get, when you get that, you know, you get those, those vulnerabilities and those weaknesses in your hand and you're trying to play a hand the thing that i was always challenged by when i played um marvel legendary is to get a hand of cards and not be able to do anything with it 
And the DC deck builder, what I really liked about that was since it was only one currency, you could always do something. You could always buy something. So you felt like you were kind of contributing to the, to the game. So that was kind of fun. I might recommend playing Street Fighter as a two-player game. Because first off, it's a lot more thematic because you're playing against somebody. And also when you're playing attack cards, you know, when we play any kind of board game, there's a tendency to kind of pile on the leader even if you don't know if they're the actual leader. So you could end up with a lot of weakness and vulnerability cards in your hand by the end of the game because everyone thinks that you're the leader and that's kind of terrible because now you're not really doing much. Yeah. Yeah, it's never fun. Yeah. The, the one one problem I had in playing this, and I don't know if it's it's the design or just luck, but the, the fellow to my right was collecting the same kind of cards I was collecting. <laughs> and so there's never anything in the tableau for me <laughs> to uh, to buy. Sure. You, you're, you get to the point where you can pick up two, three, four cards possibly in mm-hmm. one swoop and bang. So I, once you're locked into a particular strategy, it's it's sort of hard to shift gears to try something else if you find that someone else is doing the same thing you're doing. Sure. But that that's common to a lot of deck builders, I imagine. Yeah, I'd like to see that there were, you know, we as board gamers, we often don't like to have player elimination games. But I actually would have liked to see that with the Street Fighter game because it would have been nice if you did have a four or five player game to have players knocked out and then have a final battle instead of just having everyone constantly throwing weaknesses. I mean, that's the theme of Street Fighter, to knock the other players out. I like that. Where the, Naruto, yeah, yeah. Where the Naruto is always about building this coalition, so it makes sense. It could be at the end of every round, the weakest player drops out, and so on down to, you're down yeah. to two. Count up victory points and see where they're Because if you realize that you aren't going to win, you'd probably want to just walk go walk away and do something else anyway. <laughs> go play something else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially with the fact that the Street Fighter takes so much longer. Yeah, that's tough. I can't imagine a game with this engine taking a long time. Yeah. Because that's one of the best things about DC Deck Builder or any of the other ones is that it takes 30, 40 minutes. Yeah, there's no downtime. There's no slowdown. It's just beautifully efficient. And if you end up breaking that... Eh. Yeah. So in Street Fighter versus Naruto Shippuden... The deck building games, as far as the battle is concerned, the final victor, I'm going to have to go with Naruto. I think as far as the theme is concerned, it really does play well with the mechanics. Building those special skills and ability, building those coalitions, whether they're good guys or bad guys. And the fact that the individual player cards do match with the theme, that Naruto benefits from having enemies and just basic attacks and kind of spamming them. And based upon the other people matching with their certain kind of chakra abilities, it's just outstanding. I think this is honestly the best version of the DC deck building slash Cerebus engine slash AEG kind of massive yet very small tiny deck building game. So it's my favorite. Yeah, I mean, I I think looking at these two, I think um, I agree with you that Naruto is going to be the winner here just because... Uh, I like the idea of building up chakra. I think that's a very, a very good way to capture the the theme of the Naruto Shippuden games as well as the Naruto universe. Uh, and beating a stage is not nearly as satisfying as beating an enemy, right? Like there's just, uh, and you have to worry about the slowdown with Street Fighter. Uh, and also, I just think that not the Naruto decks are just more attractive too. Sure, just a minor thing, but adds to it. It's a pass for me. I mean, I look, I like the artwork in much the same way that a lot of people like the Munchkin artwork. It's it's fun to look at. I like the characters and how they're drawn, and everyone's so serious and passionate and excited. And <laughs> um, but that's about it. Uh, it takes a really special deck builder to hold my interest, and it's probably just trains and ascension right now. The only ones that really. So you hear a pass on both. Hmm? So no, those are the only two I like. So, oh, no, 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 pass on but both pass on all the other and, and, yeah. and Naruto. So neither yeah. win. Bo- bo- and <laughs> Nar- Naruto versus Street Fighter. Oh, you don't have to, def- does, do I have to choose between one? Yeah, no. Person. In the end, there no. could be only yeah. one, Drew. And, and, and Naruto <laughs> versus Street Fighter, it's a double knockout? Uh, no, it's just I'm tired of Street Fighter. It was like, yeah, we were making fun of it earlier. It's, <laughs> it is. It's, it's a joke in, in a lot of ways because it was such a part of our cultural heritage. Yeah. Um, Naruto. All right. All right. Cool. I mean, yeah, I mean, probably for me, Naruto looks more interesting as well. Um, if I was going to play... I like the idea of the Street Fighter as a two-player, but I would never buy a deck builder to be a two-player. 
Yeah. Maybe like Star Realms or something. Two on two, I think it'd be a great way to play. Yeah. Give that a shot. And there's been talk about having the ability to get put characters from one game in another game and kind of mashing them together. Mash up. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. there hasn't been a deck list out there yet that's kind of been effective. So if you want to kind of muddle along and try to put these together, you could do that because they should all work together, including the DC deck building one, but it's a little iffy. Yeah, I mean, so if they use card types that aren't present in the other games, though, you'd have to make conversions, right? So, like, sure. Batman requires equipment. Throw him into Naruto where there are no equipment. and Well, they, there's, there's um, contemporaries. I don't know if contemporaries is the right word, but... There's analogs, right? Analogs, yeah. There's... There's analogs for all the different games. So there is equipment in Naruto, but there's other different kind of materials there. So you would have yeah. to find some sort of... Conversion kind of, system. Yeah, absolutely. Also, Superman versus anyone in any of these <laughs> other universes. Just like, <laughs> Superman versus Guile. Run, Guile! Run! For the love of God! <laughs> You're gonna die! <laughs> But the sonic boom, it's kryptonite infused? <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. Every, everyone is kryptonite infused in these worlds. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, so, I mean, I think the bottom line on any cryptozoic deck builders is, you know, what theme do you like more, and then do the mechanics rub you the right or wrong way in any given case? Um, there's so many options, like Chris said, and like potato chips. So, if you don't like anime and you don't like video games, then neither one of these is going to be very interesting. But if you like Lord of the Rings, you got that. If you like Penny Arcade, you got that. If you like DC, you got eight of those. Yeah. <laughs> but this isn't like um, Ticket to Ride, where every single set is slightly different. I mean, all all of them follow all of the same rules. Is that the? They have a slight oh, variation yeah. on each. There is a slight. Yeah, okay. there's variation. Yeah, the variation make thematic. So it, it is fair to compare them and see, you know, like different yeah. how each one plays out. Yeah, yeah, like for example, the the ch- the chakra system with the base cards versus the ultra cards. For the Street Fighter, sure. how they kind of play in, but it's not too heavy of a difference. Okay. Yeah. The core mechanics remain the same, but they add some twists that make it more thematic. Which one of the, Yeah, you, you want to know what the tweaks are because, yeah. like I said, this chakra at least made this game more made Naruto Naruto. Sure. The chakra made Naruto more interesting. Too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The ultra cards for Street Fighter are good, and it's a matter of when you want to buy them to add them to the deck so you can use that special ability, but. Theme wise, Naruto wins out because it fits with everything that you're doing throughout the game, whereas the Street Fighter special ability only comes out once in a while. Alright, so there you have it. Naruto is our winner in this week's Versus. Believe it! <laughs> oh god. <laughs> We're so sorry for that. <laughs> Anywho. Anywho. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Oh! <laughs> And now it's time for our final round. Uh, This week's final round, it's Halloween, of course, coming up. There are a lot of games out there that uh, would be perfect for Halloween that carry that theme with witches and ghosts and monsters and and what have you. So I'm going to start off with a witch game that I really enjoyed uh, recently because it's one of those semi-cooperative games, um, Discworld Witches. Because, well, first of all, if you like Terry Pratchett and like his books, it's, it's well-themed. And uh, you're, just, you're just a bunch of witches flying around the map trying to defeat monsters. And uh, it's, it's semi-cooperative to the point that you're hoping, you know, you all have to work together. Because if you don't, things go to heck very quickly. Mm-hmm. So you have to try and uh, keep the game winnable. But you also want to get the most points for yourself. It's like one of these um, first among equals kinds of games. But I, the graphics are pretty cool. The components, the, the little tiles, I think it's well, it's bright and well made and right on theme. Um, it's not that you have to do a lot of witchy things. You're not making potions or anything, <laughs> but you know, you get to be a witch for a while and have fun. All right, well, my Halloween game is going to be obvious to anyone who's listened to this podcast for an extended period of time. Portrayal of the House on the Hill. It is one of my favorite games of all time. It is amazingly flexible, replayable, and entertaining. And it is perfect for a Halloween-centered game, right? You're stuck in a haunted house, 
at least one of the people in this house is probably a monster or demon or wants to summon one or is an alien or a giant bird's going to come and pick up the house. Or, yeah, so you get the point, right? Uh, it's fantastic. If you don't already own it, you're doing something wrong. Go buy it. Um, and it's it's definitely my Halloween game. All right, so for me, um, it's I'm not big on like horror-themed games or anything like that, but uh, one that I thought was pretty cool, and it comes from a guy who's done a lot of really beautiful-looking games, uh, is uh, Ghost Stories from Anton Bowser. Um, there are a couple of very, you know, different expansions, a couple versions, but it's extremely hard, <laughs> as, a, as a good co-op should be, and it's got that Bowser look and feel to it. I mean, that, that sounds frightening. Like, you know yeah. you're going to die. You're just not going to win this game. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many different kind of Halloween games, and when I think Halloween, I think about all the different genres that kind of get mashed together when you see all the different costumes. So I'm going to go with mashup. Monster Smash Expansion. And Drew likes that because he's, he's a smash up guy. So with yeah. this expansion, you get the four classic kind of monsters. You get vampires. You get mad scientists, which bring in your Frankenstein monster. You get werewolves and the classic 1950s giant ants. <laughs> so you really have all the classic monsters and... Since Smash Up is a huge universe of a multitudes of zombies and aliens and robots and Cthulhu and 500 other yeah. things, you really could put together a wonderful Halloween type of experience by mashing all those decks together. It's like a Saturday afternoon matinee of, of horror films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> It's kind of to that, that uh, Scooby-Doo spinoff where they taught at the school for monsters. Was it? That was a Scooby-Doo spinoff, right? Uh, no one else remember. Could I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Never mind! <laughs> All right, so that is everything for this week. This is Anthony. This is Chris. This is Daniel. From beyond. <laughs> and this is Drew. We, we did this without telling the other guys. This is Daniel! I don't know. <laughs> and until next time, we'll save you some spooky candy treats. <laughs> Yay, candy! Yeah. Yeah. I love candy. I love candy. Candy, candy, candy. That's why you have kids, you know. Yeah, right? So you can go around with them and collect the candy. <laughs>